Good afternoon, Black Health Matters family. Thank you for staying with us. And now we're gonna have a discussion about clinical trials. Um, and the person who helped curate this panel is our next guest, Dr. Carol L. Brown of Memorial Sloan Kettering. So Dr. Brown recommended that we have Dr. Campbell, who spoke with us about prostate cancer, which was a great talk, and also with Dr. Pack, who talked with us this morning about lung cancer. So we've learned a lot. So we thank you and thank MFK for their support of today's discussion. Now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about clinical trials and why they are so incredibly important. Medical products are safer and more effective for everyone when clinical research includes diverse populations. It may seem obvious, but it's worth stating when segments of the population are not included in clinical trials at levels that don't meet statistical significance, it's impossible to determine if that therapy in question will work equally, better, or worse for the population than which it's studied. So it's important that we really participate, be open to it, and evaluate it as an option. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Carol Brown, who I affectionately call my badass surgeon. She is a miracle worker and is the director uh, office of the Office of Diversity in Clinical Care Research and Training at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Brown received her undergraduate degree from Harvard and her MD from Columbia. She is also the 50th president of the Society for Gynecologic Oncology. So again, she carries great stature and we're so happy to have her with us. Good afternoon, Dr. Brown. Good afternoon, Rosalind, and good afternoon, Black Health Matters family. I'm so excited to be here and I'm gonna jump right into my talk because we don't have- All right, I'm gonna oh. you. Go get them, Dr. Brown. Okay. So, um, as I said, I'm really happy to be here today and to talk to you about why cl cancer clinical trials matter for black health. So the reason this is important is because um, it's not just about disparities, it's about injustice. And inequity in healthcare is a form of injustice. That was a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. And the reason that I do what I do every day is because of that quote and because of my father, Dr. Charles Emerson Brown, uh, who is a, a surgeon who also fought for healthcare equity in Los Angeles, California. So this is a slide from SEER that shows you what are the most common cancers in the United States in 2020. And I want you to look carefully for both males and females. The top cancers are lung, colon, breast and prostate and uterine cancer. Now I'm gonna show you a series of slides that are gonna go by very quickly so I wanna test your ability to recall. I want you to see if you detect a pattern when you're looking at these slides. These are slides that are showing you the relative um, mortality or rate of death from these cancers in the United States, all right? Ready, here we go. Breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Anybody see a pattern? I'll point it out to you that black people who have these cancers have excessive mortality. That means the number of people dying per 100,000 population is much, much higher for black people than for any other group. We've already learned very recently this is true for COVID and it's true for the most common cancers in the United States. Here's wh why I'm a GYN oncologist and the thing that I'm very passionate about and my colleague earlier talked about this. For uterine cancer, for the last 30 years, there is a 20% lower five-year survival for black women with uterine cancer in the United States than white women. It hasn't changed in 30 years. That's crazy and it's unacceptable. So this is why clinical trials are important and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. These differences in health equity or injustice in healthcare are based on many factors, but the way that clinical trials, participating in clinical trials, I believe, and we believe at Sloan Kettering, can actually get rid of these injustices and give us health equity in cancer is because 
a lot of these differences, including for the, some of the cancers I just showed you, actually aren't just in access to care. They're in finding the right type of care. They're in, they're in finding what is the molecular difference, the biologic difference in the type of breast cancer that black women get compared to white women and designing treatments and targets that can actually address these differences. So let's talk about what are clinical trials. So you may or may not be aware, but there are different phases of clinical trials. There are basically three different types of clinical trials. The first type is called phase one trials. And basically nowadays, phase one trials mean that the drug that's being studied or the therapy that's being studied it doesn't actually mean it has no effect. That's what it used to mean, that it was just being studied to see if it was toxic. But nowadays, phase one trials usually mean that it's something that's very new, the size of the trial is very, very small, and the major goal is to find out what are side effects, but also to see if there's any activity. So phase one studies are usually pretty small, but they also happen very quickly and they also are a good way to get access to new treatments. What are phase two trials? Now phase two trials nowadays are the most common type of trial. And there's really been a, a sea change even in the last five years. It used to be that phase three trials that I'm gonna talk about in a minute were the way that all the great changes are made. That's totally different now. Phase two trials are the key and phase two trials are the reasons that we have a lot of the molecular targeted therapies that we've gotten approved in the last three or four years. Phase two trials are predominantly designed to figure out, does a therapy work? Does this cancer drug or targeted therapy work? They also have a relatively smaller number of patients, usually between 25 and 100 participants, um, and they actually can happen pretty quickly meaning a trial can enroll and finish enrolling patients often within a few months or a year, depending on how common the cancer is and the availability of the trial. They usually focus on a particular type of cancer as well. Phase three trials are the classic um, prospective randomized controlled trial where you're comparing two different types of therapy. You might be comparing drug A to drug B, you might be comparing doing surgery through a minimally invasive approach, as my colleague was talking about earlier, to doing it via an, op via an open approach. And you're trying to determine which of those two treatments is the one that's better than the other. In a phase three, in a phase three trial, you're not gonna be getting something that doesn't work. You're gonna be participating in a study that's trying to find out if something works better than something else, or if something works just as well as something else. And it's important to remember that Phase three trials and even some phase two trials may not just be of drugs. They could be of a surgical technique. They could be of a device. Uh, they could be of a new type of radiology study. So these trials usually have a lot more patients. They often are done on a national or international basis. Why should you participate in a clinical trial? There, well, there are a lot of good reasons and helping your fellow man and fellow woman um, do better and learn more about cancer is definitely one of the reasons, but I'm here to tell you about why you should do it. What's in it for you? And what's in it for you as a cancer patient is access to the latest and the best interventions in drugs, targeted therapies, before they become widely available. If the treatment is a, is a success, then you're going to be one of the first patients to benefit from that treatment. The other major reason that I think is particularly important for Black people to participate in clinical trials is that we know that a lot of the disparities in healthcare outcomes are due to lack of access to high quality care. And when you participate in a clinical trial, a cancer clinical trial or another clinical trial, you are pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be getting access to the leading physicians and exceptional care because during a clinical trial, Things are often checked on more often. Side effects are checked on more often. There are a lot of rules and regulations that the doctors and, and uh, investigators have to follow to make sure that you're getting the right dose, the right treatment, et cetera. So it's a really good way to make sure you're getting very intense, high quality care. And then of course, it is an opportunity to make a valuable contribution to curing cancer in everybody. So what are some common questions? How do you know if you're eligible? 
Are there risks for participating in a clinical trial? If you enroll in a clinical trial, will you get a placebo rather than your regular treatment? That's a very common question. Are the costs of a clinical trial covered by my insurance if I participate? And if you have Medicare or most common insurances that are private insurances, they do cover the cost of a clinical trial. And we have President Clinton to thank for that because a law was passed during his administration that required all Medicare uh, plans to cover the cost of being in a clinical trial. But guess what? Medicaid, another federal government insurance program, is not required to cover the cost of a clinical trial. And there's legislation right now in Congress trying to get this uh, approved. But the cost of a clinical trial should be covered by your insurance. And if you don't have insurance, you can still participate in clinical trials. So some of these questions we'll address if you come to our chat in the MSK booth. Um, but so I'm gonna go on a little bit more and talk a little bit more in detail about why trials are important. So the reason trials, cancer clinical trials particularly are so important is that cancer clinical trials are absolutely a crucial, I will say the crucial step nowadays in finding new and promising ways to improve treatments for cancer and save lives. Most of the practice changing advances in cancer, and I'm gonna use GYN cancer, particularly endometrial cancer as an example, have come about through cancer clinical trials. So let's talk about cancer clinical trials. And I'm just gonna give you some examples from Sloan Kettering. Remember those cancers I talked to you about that have the greatest disparities for black people, colon, lung, breast, prostate, so colon cancer trials at MSK, these are slides are a little bit dated, but just to give you an example, black patients have an 8% lower cure rate for colon cancer. And um, at the time that I made the slide, we had four uh, clinical trials in colon cancer that looked at targeted therapies, precision medicine, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And we have one trial that was specifically trying to explain why black patients do differently than white patients with colon cancer. In terms of breast cancer, you heard um, my colleague earlier talk about the importance of breast cancer and the differences in black women's outcome for breast cancer. Well, clinical trials are critically important, particularly clinical trials in triple negative breast cancer, which is a type of breast cancer that black women tend to be more likely to get and is more aggressive. And we have clinical trials at MSK that are led by our medical oncologists, specifically in triple negative breast cancer, including trials run by Dr. Diana Lake and Dr. Tiffany Trena. Uterine cancer, my favorite, my passion. Remember, black women have a 21% lower five-year survival rate for endometrial cancer lasting for 30 years. Why is this? I believe the reason this is lies in the molecular biology of the cancers that black women get. And one of our uh, on medical oncologists, Dr. Vicki Macker, led a national study that is leading to the approval of targeted therapies for endometrial cancer. This study was practice changing, and it is, it is opened up a way to save the lives of many, many women who otherwise would not have had any options. And the, the drug that was referenced earlier is called pembrolizumab. It's a precision medicine drug um, that targets and certain women about uh, between 10 and 15% of women, we don't know how many black women because we need you to participate in the trial so we can figure out, but a certain percentage of women are gonna have a biomarker that shows us that their cancer will respond to pembrolizumab. So clinical trials are really important for you to participate in. Multiple myeloma is a type of blood cancer that also has a very adverse outcome for black patients compared to white patients. And we have an investigator, Dr. Ola Landgren, who specializes in this type of cancer, and he has practice-changing trials ongoing right now at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he is very interested in trying to improve the outcome of Black patients by getting them to participate in these trials. So what are some of the barriers? Why don't Black patients and poor patients and Latino, Latinx patients participate in clinical trials? Well, here's a list of some of the barriers, but the most important barrier that I have found is actually physicians not being aware and physicians not offering clinical trials to their patients. Um, earlier, you heard about being an advocate. So my message to you as a cancer patient, you need to be an advocate and you need to ask about what clinical trials you might be able to participate in because that is a way that you can really make sure you get the best care and survive your cancer. What we've learned at Sloan Kettering is 
that if we tell people about clinical trials in a culturally sensitive, appropriate way that they can understand and explain to them the risks and benefits, that there is no difference in terms of patients participating in clinical trials. The bottom line is if patients have cancer, they want to live, they want the best care, they want the latest advances. And at Sloan Kettering, one out of every three patients participates in a clinical trial, and it doesn't matter the color of their skin or whether they're poor or have insurance. So I want to just briefly again touch about precision medicine, as my colleagues talked about earlier. This is really, really important because this is the future of a lot of cancer therapy. Regular chemotherapy basically works by killing all the cells in your body that are dividing rapidly. And that's why regular chemotherapy has some significant side effects like losing your hair. Precision medicine is like sending a smart bomb in to attack just the cancer cells. And so precision medicine is here now. It's not the future, it's now. And this is a way to treat a bunch of cancers, even if they're from different parts of your body, as long as they all have the same biomarker or signal that makes them vulnerable to the precision medicine um, target. The MSK impact test is a test that we developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it is an FDA approved test that allows your tumor to be profiled for its DNA. So we learn what are the particular vulnerabilities or targets that your cancer has that can be attacked with a precision medicine drug. As I mentioned before, this has changed the way the cancer clinical trials are done. Now, a lot of trials are what we call basket trials. So instead of a trial in lung cancer or colon cancer or uterine cancer, there's one trial for all of the uh, cancers, no matter where they started in your body, that have a particular target that makes them vulnerable. So they're all treated together with the precision medicine drug. This is an example of a particular type of uh, cancer that had a particular type of target, um, a breast cancer patient. And it's just showing you on the left-hand side, a scan and all those little dots are parts of, um, or spots where the cancer was. And the slide on the right is showing you what that scan looked like after this patient had been treated with a targeted smart bomb therapy directed at that specific molecular target that this patient had. And this is an example of how effective these targeted precision medicine therapies can be. So participating in a cancer clinical trial is actually the best way to level the playing field for black people affected by cancer. If you or a loved one is affected by cancer, ask your doctor about clinical trials. Moral Sloan Kettering is leading the way to understanding these differences in how cancer affect different groups of people at the molecular level. And we're developing precision treatments to end cancer disparities. So I wanna thank you for your attention. This is a photograph of some of the amazing black physicians, oncologists that I work with at Sloan Kettering. If you visit our booth, I also targeted a few of the younger uh, black physicians, oncologists that you can visit who specialize in different types of cancer. Um, to make an appointment with the Dr. Sloan Kettering, you call that number and to find out more about cancer clinical trials, go to our website. Thank you very much and I'll now take some questions. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions to my left. Um, so, give me one second here. All right, so the first question, is there any reason to believe that COVID-19 crisis will increase funding for cancer of, in black people? Um, I don't know that it's going to be related to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but I do think that the um, whole focus on systemic and structural racism is going to help the cause of uh, ending cancer disparities for all people. Um, how do you find out about current clinical trials? So um, you can, to find out about current clinical trials at Sloan Kettering, you can go to our website or you can call um, and the number and talk about, you know, what type of cancer you have and that you're interested in cancer clinical trials. Um, my, one of my colleagues er, earlier mentioned going to uh, cancer.gov, which is the national uh, website which lists different types of cancer clinical trials. Uh, question number three, um, someone's asking about inclusion criteria could be more flexible because one of the reasons, that's a very good point, one of the reasons that often particularly black patients may not be eligible for clinical trials is that the eligibility criteria may exclude patients who have high blood pressure, for example, or who are overweight or who have diabetes. And there absolutely is a national movement being led by the NCI to 
change, uh, make more flexible eligibility criteria. So more patients that live in the real world can participate. Um, can we expect to see more community-based research that may involve more education of black populations about the function of clinical trials? I love that question because at Sloan Kettering, my colleagues in the Cancer Health Equity Research Program are leading a community outreach uh, program. And yes, and this, this um, session that you're participating in right now, we are absolutely, there are so many sources of information. Uh, was mentioned earlier, Ikana led by Kimmy Dahl, um, the great work of the advocate groups. There's lots of information about there, out there now and support learning about cancer clinical trials. Um, okay, uh, let's see. How is one chosen for a phase of a clinical trial? So basically, to get into a clinical trial, it's going to be going between you and your physician talking about what, is, what are the different options for you at whatever point you are in your cancer journey. Um, and you may be eligible for any one of these phases of trials. I do want to emphasize something. Cancer clinical trials are not the end of the road. That is not true. Nowadays, they may be the beginning of the road. They may be the best option for you, particularly with targeted therapies. So don't think that clinical trials are something that you only are going to do at the end of your life or when everything else has been exhausted, because they may very often be something that's offered to you up front or offered to you after you've had your first surgery. How do we overcome the fear that we as African Americans have about participating in clinical trials? A lot of us are reluctant to do the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. So I'm gonna to speak to you as a black cancer surgeon at Sloan Kettering for 30 years. And I'm gonna tell you again, one out of every three patients that we see, no matter whether they're black, white, Asian, poor, whatever, participate in clinical trials. And the reason is that there should be no fear. Once you get past the fear of having cancer, right, you want the best, what's best for you and your best opportunity. The way we get past this as Black Americans is getting over our fear of cancer and knowing that by going to a specialist, by going to a GYN oncologist like my colleague in Fayetteville, when you have uterine cancer, then you are going to get the best care. You have to advocate for yourself. Cancer clinical trials are not experiments being done um, in the way that the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was, was done. And all of that has been changed and you just have to understand, again, there's nothing to be afraid of except not, you know, not getting treatment for your cancer and not finding out about it. Um, okay, uh, does MSK utilize any community health workers to increase education of clinical trials for uh, black patients? And what are my thoughts about community health workers and clinical trial education? I think community health workers are extremely important. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have the Cancer and Immigrant Health Service. You, they, are, they are in our booth. They have an outstanding out, community outreach program to educate people about clinical trials and general health issues and cancer screenings as well. So you can visit their, uh, their booth and go onto their website and find out about more of those programs. Um, if someone is undergoing chemotherapy at a different hospital, is it possible to get considered for a clinical trial at MSK? The answer is, it is possible to get considered for a clinical trial no matter where you're getting your treatment, but what you should first do is advocate for yourself and ask your oncologist where you are, preferably before you start any treatment. What clinical trials do you have available and can I Am I eligible for any of them? And if not, or if you're not advising me for a clinical trial, why not? So that's what I advise you to do. How is patient information protected in a clinical trial? Very extensively. Um, there is a whole set of regulatory standards that are very, very critical to protect patient privacy and protect your information. And you can, we can go into that in more detail if you visit our booth in our chat. What are the most effective channels for recruiting Black and Latinx patients into clinical trials? Advertising, advocacy organization, directly via physicians. I think all of those are ways, but I think that this type of forum is also extremely important um, in doing so because I believe in getting direct messaging out to people. Um, and I think that, um, but again, most people who participate in a cancer clinical trial still to this day are doing so at the recommendation of their primary care doctor or their oncologist. So I would echo the message earlier, you gotta be your own advocate or if you have a family member who has cancer, just remember that this is one of the questions you should add 
to your first encounter with your oncologist, whether it's a surgical oncologist or a medical oncologist, what about clinical trials for my mom? Is she eligible for any? So that's important. Um, what are my thoughts about cultural competency to learn about biases um, um, that exist among oncologists and their approach to blast for clinical trial enrollment? Um, I, there is a lot of information about this or a lot of studies that have been done already that show that probably one of the reasons that a lot of um, black and poor patients and, and even white patients with medical comorbidities don't go on clinical trials is that they're not offered them. And they're not offered them because their physicians are already biased in thinking that they won't wanna do it, they won't be compliant. So you're absolutely right. Educating the physicians is really important, as important as educating the patients. And there are definitely many, many programs um, that are working on that. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip some of these. Uh, once you're in a clinical trial, does it prevent you from receiving other appropriate treatment? The answer is no. In fact, if you're on a clinical trial and you have to come off of the clinical trial, whether it's because of side effects or because your cancer doesn't respond, um, you definitely will be able to get the appropriate treatment. And most clinical trials will specifically tell you that in the consent form. It's going to explain um, you know, the conditions in which you would come off the trial. So it doesn't prevent you from getting appropriate treatment. Um, OK. Uh, let's see. And I think I have time for maybe one. I have time for a couple more questions. Um, this is a question. I'll read this one. Big Pharma stands to lose billions if research concludes that there are drug-free approaches to address health concerns and conditions. How can we advocate for more interventional treatment research? I'm assuming that that question means how can we advocate for more, not interventional treatment, but uh, probably complementary medicine or alternative medicine treatments. And I would tell you that um, I think they go hand in hand and there are definitely complementary medicine treatments that have a role and there are even clinical trials that include them. Um, at Sloan Kettering, we have a whole, a whole division of complementary medicine and we actually have clinical trials of acupuncture and other therapies. Um, there is a whole body of research about the importance of the gut microbiome, meaning the bacteria that live in your gut and how it relates to your immune system. This is paradigm shifting research that's going on at Sloan Kettering and other institutions, um, including at Cornell and some of the other institutions that are represented here. So it's all science. That's what I'm gonna tell you. It's all science and it, it is being incorporated, um, particularly the role of the gut in the immune system. Okay, um, so I think that that is all the questions. I think I covered all the questions. Um, so I'm gonna thank you and end here. Thank you.